Hello, I'm Keith Frankish. Welcome to the fourth lecture in this course on the illusionist view of consciousness. This lecture is called Objections to Illusionism. So just to remind you of the, the plan of the lectures, I started by introducing the problem of phenomenal consciousness. The, the idea is that having a conscious experience involves being acquainted with private mental qualities, qualia, phenomenal properties. Um, which seem quite mysterious and hard to explain in scientific terms. And I explained that the, I mentioned various responses to this problem, uh, including the illusionist response, which is to deny that these private mental qualities are real. Uh, they're a kind of illusion, an introspective illusion. Uh, then in the, in the uh, next two lectures, we looked at some reasons for adopting the illusionist view. In lecture two, we looked at the case against the realist view of phenomenal consciousness, the, the view that these mental, private mental qualities do exist and that uh, uh, experience, having an ex a conscious experience involves being mentally acquainted with them. And we saw that there are uh, some, some significant difficulties for that, for that view. Um, difficulties in knowing what one's own qualia actually are. Then in lecture three, we looked at um, uh, some arguments, some positive arguments for illusionism, for re some reasons for thinking that illusionism offers a better uh, theory of consciousness than, uh, than, its re than realist uh, alternatives. Okay, but during the course of that, um, uh, some objections to illusionism, I'm, I'm sure some objections to, illusion to illusionism have occurred to you, uh, and certainly they've, uh, um, uh, they've occurred to many philosophers, and... Uh, so in this lecture, we're going to look at, at some of those, and uh, I'll try to uh, I'll, uh, indicate how the illusionist um, uh, would respond to these objections. So um, let's begin with a, a very basic objection, um, which I've called the denial objection. I think for many people, this is the um, this, this is the, this is the basic issue. Um, they think this objection alone is sufficient to to write off. Illusionism as as a possible as a possible theory. Uh, so it's it, it goes like this. It's a very simple um, uh, objection. I'll, I'll set this this objection and the others out in the form of a dialogue between the realist, the person who believes in qualia and uh, the, who believes that consciousness involves acquaintance with mental qualities, and the and the illusionist um, um, re replying to them. So the realist says, "Well, look, you illusionists, you're denying that we have experiences." Are denying that we that we see that we hear that we smell that we taste that we that we feel pain and pleasure and so on, uh, that's that's absurd. Um, the illusionists could be refuted with a with a punch on the nose, so they see that pain exists. Uh, I should say, if this if this argument were were sound, then illusionists could also be refuted with some pleasant experience. It wouldn't have to be a punch on the nose. You could. Um, give them a nice piece of chocolate cake, for example, and that should be equally effective. Um, so what does the illusionist say uh, in response? Well, they say something like this, uh, that we need to distinguish two concepts of experience. First of all, a, a functional concept of experience. This is the psychological concept. <clears throat> a concept of experience as a state with a certain causal role, a state that does certain things uh, w within, the, within, the, um, within the mind-brain system. So it's a state that's um, typically caused by the stimulation of the, of the sense organs, of, of some, some specific sense organ that carries information about um, the environment or about the state of our own bodies, and that, is, uh, that has effects on a wide range of control systems within the, the brain. So it has effects on belief, desire, and memory, emotion, linguistic report, decision-making, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's the kind of state we were talking about when I, I described this, this uh, cyclical process of information and reaction we talked about earlier in the uh, earlier lectures. And then the, the second concept is a, is a phenomenal concept. This state is the concept of a state, a mental state with a certain phenomenal feel to it, a certain intrinsic feel, a state which it's like something to be in. So if we take seeing an apple, the experience of the apple in the psychological sense is a state that's caused by uh, uh, 
liked where he's bouncing off an apple. Uh, that carries information about the shape and size and distance and so on of the, of the apple, and that is used to control or control our, our reactions uh, to the apple. Uh, whereas the experience in, uh, uh, an apple, uh, a visual experience of an apple in the phenomenal sense, is a state with a certain uh, uh, with, with, with a certain qualitative feel, a state that. Uh, has, uh, if the apple is red, that has a, a reddish quality to it, that has a sh shininess to it, and so on. All uh, mental versions of the properties we ascribe to the apple. Now, illusionists don't deny that we have experiences in the, f in the psychological sense. That's what they think experiences are. They think they are these complex uh, 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 functional states. But they do deny that we have experiences in the phenomenal sense. They don't think that having experience involves being aware of mental qualities. So, yes, they're de denying experience in one sense, but not in, in another. And they, moreover, they think that the sense that um, uh, that they're denying is is uh, a confused and unnecessary and unnecessary um, uh, way uh, conception of experience. Um, and similarly, the illusionist will want to distinguish two concepts of consciousness corresponding to those two senses. So if the accusation is that illusionists deny the existence of consciousness, they will say, well, um, we don't deny the existence of consciousness in the sense uh, of um, uh, possession of, experience, of experiences in the psychological sense. We just deny the existence of consciousness in the sense of, 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 uh, uh, that involves having experiences in the phenomenal sense. Okay, now the, the realist will probably come back and say something like this. Um, our everyday concept of experience is precisely the phenomenal one. When we talk about having experiences, uh, we mean experiences w with, a, with an intrinsic phenomenal feel to them, with a, with a what-it's-likeness to them. Uh, that's, that's, what we, that's, what, um, that's what we mean, that's what we're talking about. And you are, you illusionists are denying uh, uh, the existence of, ex of experience in that everyday sense. Uh, okay, so the illusionist is going to come back with something like this. Look, first of all, how people ordinarily conceive of experience and of, and of consciousness uh, is a matter for empirical research. We, should, we need to go and ask them and um, present them with um, um, thought experiments, maybe, and get to them to get, uh, find out what their concept of experience actually is. Um, uh, a lot of philosophers have this concept of experience uh, uh, as a phenomenal, as a as a phenomenal state. But we, how widespread that is among non-philosophers is a, is a matter for for investigation. I, it um, it may be that ordinary people have uh, have a have a hybrid concept of experience that combines elements of the phenomenal concept and the psychological concept. I think that's that's quite likely, actually. Um, but anyway, let's suppose that the everyday conception is the phenomenal one. Okay. It still wouldn't follow that illusionism is false. Because the everyday conception of experience may be a bad one. Maybe that people are thinking of experience in a bad way. I mean, people have had all kinds of conceptions of all sorts of natural phenomena. Uh, uh, Conceptions of uh, uh, in astronomy, in uh, in medicine, in uh, all branches of the natural sciences that have turned out to be quite wrong and have been corrected by science. Free science frequently corrects our everyday conceptions of things. I mean, uh, here's a a diagram of the ancient m model of the cosmos that that some people had with the Earth in the center there, and uh, rotating around it. Uh, uh, crystal spheres to which the uh, the planets and the fixed stars were attached. And some ancient astronomers thought that the that the stars themselves were um, were um, actually holes in in the spheres through which uh, uh, a fire beyond them uh, shone through. So they thought of stars as as holes. Um, so I mean, people have had all kinds of conceptions of of um, of the natural world, 
Um, uh, vision, take vision, for example. Um, uh, some people used to think that vision, it was it, in the ancient world, it was fairly common to think that, that vision involved rays projecting from our eyes and hitting the things that we see. The emission theory of vision. That's quite a common um, view in the ancient world. Um, and Or think about something like mental illness, about the way mental illness was explained in the past. Uh, many, many more examples. Um, um, that, um, I think what fire is, what, uh, what the elements are, and uh, what lightning is. I, I, we, endless examples. And uh, science has corrected these conceptions and is continually correcting them. But we don't think this of this as denying the existence of the things in question. When scientists rejected the uh, geocentric view of the cosmos with the Earth at the centre and replaced it with a heliocentric model, they didn't think of that as denying that the Sun and the Earth existed. Or when they realised that the stars were actually not uh, holes in, in, a, in a sphere rotating around the Earth, but, but actually massive nuclear fireballs, uh, billions upon billions of miles away, they didn't. Um, we didn't think of this as denying the existence of stars. Rather, we thought of it as telling us what stars really were. Similarly, with vision, when the emission theory was rejected, we didn't. Um, we didn't. Uh, people didn't conclude that that people don't really see. They concluded that seeing was something different from what they thought it was, and with mental illness and so on and so forth. Um, what matters is that there's a continuity in how we apply the concepts. So we, uh, we both, as the, both we today and the ancient astronomers can agree that how we identify stars, they're those things that are shining up there in the sky. And that hasn't changed. We both pick out stars in the same way, uh, initially at least, by, 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 by uh, observing them. Um, similarly with vision, we know when people are seeing things, we can point to someone and say, he's seeing that, I am seeing that, what's involved? So the change in the conception of, what, of, of, the, of the thing didn't involve changing what we're, actually ref what we're actually referring to, what we're actually, the phenomenon we're actually picking out. We can change our conception of something without changing what it is we're talking about. So the revision in our conception of the, of the thing didn't involve denying that the thing existed and introducing something completely different in its place. Uh, we continued to refer to the same thing, the same phenomenon, but changed our view of what it was. And we, similar perhaps with mental illness, we could uh, we, maybe at medieval people and, uh, uh, and we today could agree on that a certain person was had some kind of mental um, illness, but we would disagree about what uh, what uh, it was, what was actually involved in having it. Maybe the medieval people would have put it, would have ascribed it to demonic possession or something like that. And in the case of experience, we can all agree on how to explain experience, con uh, how to apply experience concepts. We can agree. Both the illusionist and the realist can agree on when people are having experiences and what they're having experiences of and so on. Uh, we can all agree on when we're in pain. Um, this is why punching me on the nose wouldn't help, because I would agree that what you produced there was a pain experience. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, it wasn't that I didn't think there were pain experiences and that, oh, I didn't know what they were and you've shown me. No, it, it's that I have a different theory of what that pain experience is, of what's happening when you punch me on the nose. Um, so, uh, and I, I don't, I don't think there's any disagreement between the illusionist and, and the realist on, on, uh, uh, on, on when experiences occur and what, um, uh, what the experiences are, are experiences of, when they're experiences of, of pain, of pleasure, of, of uh, uh, seeing something red, of tasting so on, tasting coffee or whatever, and so on. So, to sum up, illusionists don't deny that we have experiences; they just uh, propose a different view of what experiences are. Okay, um, but still, the, the the realist is likely to to follow that objection up, that denial objection up, um, with with um, with another objection. They want to 
or what I've called the datum objection. We'll say something like this. Look, it's a datum that, the, that phenomenal consciousness exists. It's something that's just basically given to us. It's not a theory we have of these things. When people thought that the stars were holes in the, in the, um, in the, um, uh, uh, in, in, in the spheres rotating around the Earth, that was a theory they had. When people thought that uh, that vision involved rays emanating from our eyes and hitting the things we were seeing, that was a theory they had. In the case of phenomenal consciousness, it, it's not a theory that we that, that we're acquainted with these mental qualities. We we just we are acquainted with them. It's the most basic things we 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 know about ourselves that you know, we we just attend to our own experiences and we see and we we find that we're immediately acquainted with these phenomenal qualities there's no it's not it's, it's not a theory it's a datum it's a basic uh starting point for any theory of consciousness uh so anyone who 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 who, who denies that that uh, uh, that claim the claim that we're acquainted with with um, the phenomenal properties is just not even beginning to uh, think about consciousness. They're thinking about something else. Now, and here's a little quote from David Chalmers The sense in which it is introspectively obvious that we feel pain is the phenomenal sense. So when we, when you hit me on the nose and I, attend to what's happening to me I'm aware of the phenomenal quality of pain directly aware of it and that's 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 undeniable strong illusionists about consciousness are committed to denying the central apparently introspective introspectively obvious data about consciousness they're committed to denying the starting point for any theory of consciousness although they do say apparently there so maybe there's a little room for for some um, uh, for some debate. Okay, so what's the illusionist going to say about that? Well, they'll say something like this. They'll agree, first of all, that careful introspective reports are data. We want to have people's reports on their own experience. It's very important data for, how, for a theory of consciousness is to know how people are disposed to describe it when they are attending carefully to what's happening, what's happening to them. That's data. However, these reports aren't guaranteed to be accurate. If they, if they report that they're acquainted with some private mental quality, that's an interesting fact about them. There's something about what's happening to them that makes them inclined to make that report. But it doesn't guarantee that the report is accurate, that they've got a... That, we're assuming, of course, that they're giving a completely sincere and careful report but it's still not guaranteed to be accurate. It's what, it's what seems to them to be happening, but maybe it's not what is actually happening. Reports, introspective reports, need interpretation in the light of theory. And uh, they can be corrected in the light of theory. Look, compare perceptual reports. Reports that people make about things they've seen and heard and so on. Which again might be thought of as data for science. You know, scientists you know, go out to make observations, either with their, uh, with their unaided senses or with instruments or whatever, and then they use these as the basis for constructing theories, right? And these perceptual reports, these observational reports, they're the, they're the data from which they start, right? And, and we don't question those. Well, no, that's not how it works. Because observation itself is theory laden. How we see the world is informed by our prior beliefs and expectations. Uh, we're not neutral observers. What we see depends to some extent on what we expect to see. Um, and we can see the same thing in different ways. We can look at the same image, different people can look at the same image and see different things. Or you can look at the same image at different times and see different things. Uh, we can so here's an example. You can look at this this image here, and you can see it as two complete uh, two very different things. Um, if you you can see it as a close up of an old woman looking down 
uh, looking to the looking down to the left uh, uh, in profile, or you can see it as a young woman uh, looking away from you um, uh, uh, to the left. The uh, the nose of the old woman becomes the chin of the younger woman, and the mouth of the old woman becomes the um, the necklace of the younger woman. So if someone asked you to give a, 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 a report of what you see, uh, if you've only noticed one interpretation, you'll say, I see, the, I see an old woman. Another person will say, I see a young woman. Uh, same image, same pattern of light rays hitting your retina, but you see different things. Seeing isn't theory neutral. Here's another example. That's, uh, uh, start with that image. This is uh, an image that can be seen in different ways. Perhaps that's the most uh, natural observation. Natural interpretation has two letters of the alphabet, K and B. At least it would be natural to someone who used um, the Latin alphabet. But you might also, perhaps, if you didn't use the Latin alphabet, you might see it as this, as as um, uh, an image reflect um, uh, reflected uh, uh, on a um, through a, an a horiz a horizontal axis. So you might see it as the reflection of those symbols there. Perhaps if your language contained the symbols uh, above, uh, well, which might be a V and a D perhaps, uh, you might see it as those symbols reflected um, uh, in, uh, in a mirror perhaps. Or you might see it as a set of numerical digits. If, those, if, if the original image was presented to you in the context of a mathematical uh, uh, in a mathematical context, alongside other mathematical um, uh, 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 equations, you might see it as that, as the, as, a, as the statement that 1 is smaller than 13. And I expect we could influence how people interpreted that ambiguous image by the context in which we presented it. If we presented it alongside uh, other letters, we, they would probably go for the... For the, um, the um, the top right interpretation presented lo alongside a lot of other examples of horizontal uh, reflection. They, 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 they would go for the third one and present it in a mathematical context and they would go for the, for the fourth one. But in each case, it's the same, um, it's the same image. The, the colours here are just to emphasise the interpretation you might place on the original uncoloured monochrome uh, image. And the illusionist will point out that... Um, that we can see natural phenomena in just um, in different ways too. Um, take a, a sunrise; you can see this uh, as uh, the sun moving upwards above a stable horizon, or you could see um, the sun as, as stable and the Earth as turning on its axis. Um, and the thought here isn't just that that you might uh, interpret what you see in different ways, but the interpretation might affect what you actually see, how you actually experience what's, uh, what's in front of you. Um, uh, another example is if you're, in a, if you're on, a, on, on, a, on a, a railway train and there's another train uh, uh, which is stopped in a station and there's another railway train next to you and the one next to you starts to move. Now, you may be confused for a moment as to whether it's your train that is moving backwards or the other train that is that is moving forwards and this isn't just a matter of, this isn't a matter of of how you think about the situation it's a matter of what you feel your experience do you for a moment you may feel you're going backwards um uh, as opposed to uh, seeing the other train going forwards so interpretations can affect what we actually experience and therefore what we report ourselves as experiencing therefore the uh, the, um, the the observational data. So that means that observational reports, reports of what we've observed around us, are not immune from correction because it may be that the theory that is tacitly informing our experience, that is shaping how we experience the world, is a bad one. Um, and uh, uh, I may feel that, that, that my, my railway carriage is moving backwards, and it isn't. But the experience of moving backwards is, and the report that I give of that experience, is inaccurate. So 
observational reports um, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of reports on uh, perceptual reports on our environment are not immune from correction. We may be seeing things the wrong way. So why should introspective reports be any different? If perception is theory laden and we can see things in different ways, why shouldn't introspection be theory laden too? And we can introspect things as uh, uh, in different ways. So uh, while perception is, is monitoring uh, the world around us, introspection is monitoring our own brain processes and maybe we introspect them as something they're not. Maybe we introspect them as phenomenal qualities, which they're not really. Maybe it's a it's it's an introspective illusion. So if you imagine the if you imagine the case of the um, the old uh, the the image of the old lady and the young woman, let's suppose that what so let's suppose that's not a a, a, a drawing but a, but but an actual uh, real old woman, okay, and when you look at her, you can see her as she really is as an old woman, or you could also see her as this young woman. Now, if you see her as the young woman, you're miss perceiving uh, her. And maybe we're misintrospecting the brain processes that introspection is tracking. We're misintrospecting them as qualia, um, when in fact uh, they're not that at all. Okay, now the realist, of course, will come back on this and they will say something like this, I guess. Look, introspective reports are quite different from perceptual ones. This, this, this analogy doesn't hold. Attentive reports of one's current phenomenal state can't be mistaken. If you attend carefully to what it's like for you at this moment, and you have the right kind of vocabulary to describe it, then the report can't be mistaken. It's the, 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 your phenomenal, um, your phenomenal properties, your qualia are presented to you in, in, in too immediate a way for you to, to mistake them. Uh, their nature is completely revealed to you in introspection. There's no possibility of your, of your missing something or getting something wrong. Now, I think the illusionist is going to say to that, well, well, how? What secures that unrevisability? What, what, what makes that the case? That, okay, that's maybe how it seems to you, but how do you know it's 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 true? Um, why is introspection so different from perception? Aren't they both uh, information gathering mechanisms? That uh, we have sense organs that are sensitive to 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 um, uh, features of the world, and uh, that uh, and sensory systems that generate models of the world on the basis of the information our sense organs supply and. I guess something similar is going to be happening with introspection. We're going to have some kind of internal uh, 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 monitoring mechanisms that are sensitive to our own brain processes, and they're going to generate some kind of model of what's what's happening within the brain. And um, what guarantees that this model is always going to be accurate any more than the, than our model of the of the external world of the of our environment is going to be? Uh, these models, have been, these mechanisms, have been, they're good enough for their purposes, but. Are they guaranteed to be perfect? No, it's hard to see why. Um, and indeed, if these, if the introspection is a representational mechanism, then it's very hard to see how it could be. Uh, uh, its results, its its outputs could always be uh, um, the um, uh, uh, accurate and unrevisable in this way. Uh, no me representational mechanism could could be could be absolutely uh, infallible in that way. It could always break down. Um, so, I guess the realist is going to have to posit something like direct acquaintance here. The, this relation we talked about last time in the last lecture, in lecture three, um, this relation, this primitive relation between the subject and their own phenomenal qualities, which their own phenomenal properties, which is not mediated by some mechanism. It's not doesn't involve. Uh, uh, constructing representations of the thing of its targets it's it's direct and immediate and um, and there's no uh, room there for uh, 
error or, uh, or for failure. Uh, but as I pointed out in the, in the last lecture, this is a rather mysterious relation to uh, to introduce. Um, difficult to explain how an evolved uh, biological organism could be acquainted with, with any aspect of the world in this direct and immediate way, even with an aspect of itself. And uh, we also have the problem that I discussed of, of what the subject of the acquaintance relation uh, would be. And uh, as we saw, it might even have to, we might even have to posit a, an immaterial soul to be the, the subject uh, of the acquaintance relation. So there are lots of problems with that. Now, the realist might, might say here, well, okay, uh, you're suggesting that introspection is, is theory-laden, that, that the way we uh, experience our inner lives, the way we introspect, is informed by a, a theory of, 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 um, um, uh, of, uh, of consciousness. Uh, the theory that uh, the, um, the mental lives consist in acquaintance with, uh, that our inner lives consist of acquaintance with qualia, and that therefore that's how we experience what's going on when we introspect. But that would suggest then that we could we could change that, that we could we could introspect our inner lives as something else. And can we? Um, can we? Uh, experience what's happening to us, can we experience our situation as one that doesn't involve phenomenal consciousness? Well, the first thing to say is that the illusionist doesn't have to claim that we can introspect differently, that we can uh, introspect our inner lives as uh, something other than, 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 than qualia field. It may be that the, uh, the illusion of phenomenality is, is hardwired into our introspective systems so that we can't uh, we can't see things, introspect things differently. Um, many perceptual illusions are like that. Uh, even when you know that it's an illusion, even if you know that, say, that uh, two lines which appear to be of different lengths, even if you know that they're of the same length, uh, you, you can't help but still experience, see them as, as, as being different. Uh, uh, illusions in that, uh, like that are said to be cognitively impenetrable. The, the, um, the beliefs you have about the situation don't change how you experience it. Uh, so all that the, 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 the illusionists basic claim is that uh, there is an illusion here and that we, on reflection, we can um, ac accept that. They don't have to claim that we can actually uh, uh, introspect our inner lives in a, in a uh, in a more accurate way, still, uh, uh, there may be possibilities uh, in this area. It may be possible uh, to uh, introspect differently. And uh, here's a here's a suggestion uh, along those lines. Imagine a, a group of people who, who I've called Mephistos. I'll explain that in, in a moment. Now, these are humans just like ours. They have minds just like ours. And they live in a world just like ours, maybe in this world. Um, the only difference from us is that they don't conceive, they don't, uh, conceive of their mental lives in the same way that we do. Uh, they don't, when they introspect, they don't think of themselves as acquainted with mental qualities. Uh, when we talk to them, when we talk to them about the qualities of, of experience and about the way that it feels to see red, uh, the, the, the feeling of pain, the mental feel, the mental quality of pain, um, uh, the, the, uh, what it's like to taste coffee and so on, they're a bit puzzled and they say, "Well, I, I understand that, you, that, that, that there are qualities involved here, but these qualities that we experience, they're qualities of things in the world. That, uh, when I when I see an apple." Um, uh, the redness of the apple, the red quality of the apple, that that's, belongs to the apple. It's not in my mind. I, I, if I try to attend to my own mind, I don't find any redness there. No, the redness is just out there on the surface of the apple. And, and, and in the case of pain, when, I, when I'm in pain, I, uh, there's certainly a, a quality of, of, of pain involved, but it's not in my mind. Uh, if, it's, if I've hurt my toe, the, the pain is down there in my toe. That's where it is. It's, it's not in my mind at all. And similarly for all the other uh, examples of phenomenal qualities, they don't think of them as being mental at all. They think of them as being firmly rooted in the, the objects uh, 
uh, in the in the in the uh, uh, external objects or in the parts of the body um, uh, to which they um, with which they're associated. So uh, this explains why I call them uh, Mephistos. I call them Mephistos because they deny that they are phenomenally conscious. Uh, when we talk to them about phenomenal properties, about the what it is likeness of the experience itself, they just say, well, there isn't anything. All this, what it's likeness that you're talking about isn't in my mind, it's out there in the world. Uh, and I call them Mephistos after uh, Goethe's character Mephistopheles from, from Faust, who is the spirit that continually denies. It's a, it's a little joke. Okay. Now, of course, the Mephistos are going to have to have different explanations for things like perceptual illusions, where we, uh, uh, where we uh, uh, seem to see something that isn't there. So if I seem to see a bright red apple, and there isn't a bright red apple there, where is the redness? Uh, if the Mephistos say, well, it's not in, in our minds, where is it? They're going to have to have some explanation for that. Maybe they will say, well, I, I, it wasn't really there at all. It, there wasn't any redness. Uh, I, I just, I falsely believed there was redness. My, my eyes lied to me and told me there was redness out there. But there, in fact, there wasn't any. Um, it was just my eyes lied to me. And also they're going to have to have different explanations for the, for, for the fact that things uh, have uh, uh, look different in different uh, lighting conditions, say. Um, maybe they say that things just change their colours in different lighting conditions, um, but things don't have a single uh, stable colour. Anyway, uh, so they're going to have to 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 do some uh, to do a bit of philosophy on this to make to make this position coherent. But it's the one they they find most natural and that they actually apply in introspection. If we ask them to introspect these uh, uh, the, the, the what it is likeness of their experience, they just say, well, there's nothing. The what it is likeness is out there in the world. And so for them, they have a, hard, a version of the hard problem too, but it's not explaining how their brains give rise to phenomenal properties. It's how the surfaces of objects give rise to, to colours in the, in, the, in the qualitative sense. How these, um, when, when, they, when their scientists study objects, they find surface um, uh, characteristics of the surface that reflect uh, uh, light of certain wavelengths and absorb light of other wavelengths, but they don't seem to find the colours, the actual redness. And so they've got now they have a problem. Not it's not the mind uh, body problem. It's the problem of the the surface color problem. Uh, and similarly for for how pressure waves in the air um, uh, create sound qualities and so on. Uh, but it's not clear that that problem is a lot harder than the than the hard problem or any harder at all than than the um, than our version of the of the hard problem. And uh, here's a nice paper by Alex Byrne from 2006, Colour and the Mind-Body Problem, which imagines how the history of philosophy might have been different if, if we'd taken this view of, of qualities and thought of them as, as externally located rather than located in our minds. And he presents versions of, of uh, um, philosophical views about uh, consciousness uh, translated into that, um, into that way of thinking. It's a, it's a very, uh, a very interesting paper, and I recommend it. Now, the moral of all this is is that if it is possible to conceive of your mental life in the way that Mephistos do, as, as as transparent with all the qualities outside there, outside in the in the world rather than inside in your mind, then that is another way of of introspecting. It's another way of seeing your own mind, as it were. Um, and if that is possible, then how can we be certain that phenomenal consciousness is a datum? Because it's not a datum for the Mephistos. And if the Mephistos are offering another way of, of another self self introspective self-conception, how can we be sure that they're wrong and we're right? There is an alternative. Um... Now, of course, that doesn't establish anything. It doesn't establish that the Mephistos are right. It doesn't establish that illusionism is right. But it just shows, uh, but it just casts doubt, I think, on, or casts some doubt, or opens room for doubt uh, uh, about the claim that phenomenal consciousness is a datum, something that cannot be questioned and has to be taken as a starting point. Okay, so um, that's the, the datum objection.
Let's go on to an, another objection now, which I've called the zombie objection. Um, all of these objections are, are linked, of course, in uh, uh, in certain ways. They're, um, they involve drawing on a, a similar bunch of intuitions. The zombie um, in, uh, argument goes like this. The realist says, if phenomenal consciousness were not real, we'd be zombies, in, in the philosophical sense, because zombies are by, defined as physical duplicates of us, uh, who have all the same psychological processes as they have experiences in the psychological sense, just like ours. They react exactly as we do. They have the same beliefs in the functional sense as we do. Um, from uh, from the outside, they're completely indistinguishable from 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 uh, 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 from us. What they lack is phenomenal consciousness. They lack. Uh, experiences in the phenomenal sense. Now, if the illusionist is right and phenomenal consciousness isn't real, then we are zombies in that sense. But zombies have no inner life. Um, as Chalmers puts it, there is nothing it is like to be a zombie. All is dark inside. The, the inner light bulb is off. Uh, but we do have an inner life. Plainly, our, our inner lights aren't off. There is a world in here just as much as and there is a world in, in, in your head and it's uh, to some extent private um, and it's kind of vivid and meaningful. There's a world of thoughts and experiences and, and things in here. Uh, uh, and there shouldn't be if, if illusionism were right. Okay, so what's the illusionist going to say to that? Well, you can probably... Yes, I think, by, uh, from what I've said already, but let's go through it. The illusionist is going to say that they're not denying that we have an inner life. Um, they're just denying that our inner life consists in acquaintance with mental qualities. Again, they're proposing a, a reconceptualization of what our inner life is. Um, they're not proposing to deny that it exists. It's, again, it's like the, the stars and vision and mental illness and so on. They're proposing a different, uh, a, a different account of, of what the thing is. Okay, so we all agree that there's, there's this inner life. How we just gesture vaguely at what's going on in, in our minds. That's real. The question is what it involves. And the illusionist denies that it involves acquaintance with mental qualities, with qualia. Instead, they say that it involves introspective awareness of one's brain processes. Okay, so it involves this second set of informational and reactive pro uh, uh, processes targeted now not on uh, things around us uh, in the external world, but targeted on our own uh, mental processes, on our own experiences. So in this model, we have two levels of experience, as it were, uh, experience in the psychological sense in the functional sense so we have first order experience which involves uh, sensitivity to features of the world around us and of our own bodies and the construction of representations and models uh, of, uh, of the world around us and uh, uh, the, the use of that of those models and rep those representations and models to control reactions uh, to the world and then we have second order uh, experience, introspective experience, which is sensitive to features of those first order of those first order experiences, uh, and again involves the construction of representations and models that allows us to to uh, that, that are used to control our reactions to the, our own experiences. So we can uh, recognize our experiences, we can uh, remember them, we can. Uh, uh, think about them, we can report them, we can adopt all sorts of attitudes to our own experiences in virtue of these introspective processes. But this introspective uh, uh, awareness is nothing like the uh, direct, uh, uh, acqu direct acquaintance with phenomenal properties. Um, it's 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 not an, uh, a direct and infallible like that. It's it's mediated by all kinds of uh, representational processes. It's uh, subpersonal representational processes, I should say. It's it's mediated by all kinds of representational processes. It's it's fallible, and it, it may be distorting. After all, perception, uh, our perception of the world is highly selective. Um, 
uh, we're sensitive only to features that are that are likely to have some significance for us that offer uh, threats or opportunities or whatever. Uh, we're not sensitive to every aspect of the world around us. Similarly, we're not going to be introspectively sensitive to every aspect of our own um, um, uh, experiences. We don't need to be. We just need to have some uh, to be aware of some general features of them that allow us to 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 exercise the kind of higher level control that it's useful for us for us um, uh, to do. But nevertheless, this awareness is perfectly real. And in virtue of this awareness, it's accurate to say, in one sense, that our experiences are like something for us. They're like something in the way that the world is like something for us, in that we are sensitive to it, we have information about it, and uh, we can use that information to react to it in an intelligent way. Similarly, our experiences are like something for us, in the sense that we have information about them, that uh, <clears throat> that we're sensitive to them, that we have information about them that we can use to control, uh, uh, to guide our reactions to them. Or well, it might be more appropriate to say that our brains have that information. Um, a lot of these processes are going to be subpersonal, but they support their uh, uh, personal attitudes, personal uh, introspective beliefs and so on. So our experiences are like something in the sense that they're objects uh, of which we're aware. They're part of our world in that way. But not in virtue of awareness of any uh, uh, qualitative properties. There's no inner, inner light. What there is is a, a lot of inner informational and reactive processes. So we again, we, could, we can distinguish two kinds of of what it is like, there's two kinds of subjectivity, which we might call qualitative subjectivity. This is the, the inner light version of subjectivity, the phenomenal properties version of subjectivity, the, the one that, that uh, zombies uh, and, 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 and we too, if illusionism is right, lack. And functional subjectivity, the sub sort of subjectivity that depends on this kind of second order experience, these second order informational and reactive processes that I've been talking about. Um, and again, illusionists uh, uh, say that we are we don't have an inner life in the qualitative. We don't we're not don't have a subjective inner life in the qualitative sense, but we do have one in the functional sense. And they would have, that's 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 all we need. Uh, functional subjectivity itself uh, creates the impression of qualitative subjectivity. I want to say impression here, I mean it creates uh, the psychological impression. It uh, um, leads us to interpret our inner lives as uh, uh, populated with uh, phenomenal properties. So here's a, a little anecdote that might, um, that might be um, uh, applicable here. Uh, it's uh, from the philosopher Elizabeth Anscombe, and she's uh, describing uh, uh, an encounter with Ludwig Wittgenstein. And Anscombe says this, Wittgenstein once greeted me with the question, why do people say that it was natural to think that the sun went round the earth rather than that the earth turned on its axis? And Anscombe goes on, I replied, I suppose because it looked as if the sun went round the earth. Well, he asked, what would it have looked like if it had looked as if the earth turned on its axis? Uh, would have looked the same, of course. It's a matter of how you in interpret uh, the, um, the, uh, the 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 scene that you're that you're looking at. Um, and uh, maybe we can uh, apply a similar thought to, to to introspection. Many people find it very natural to to um, to think that uh, their inner lives involve. Uh, direct acquaintance with, with mental qualities, with, with, with phenomenal properties. Uh, so um, why is it natural um, for them to, uh, uh, to take that view? Um, well, I suppose because it seems as if we, we do have an inner world of, of mental qualities. That's how it seems to us. But what would it seem like? What would it have seemed like if it had seemed like introspection misrepresented us as having an inner world of mental qualities? Uh, well, again, it would it would 
seem the same. Uh, it would uh, produce the same range of, 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 of beliefs and intuitions and reactions and so on. Okay, so um, that's my uh, response to the to the to the zombie objection. Uh, again, we we need to make a distinction. We, it, um, uh, the illusionist isn't denying that we have an inner life. Uh, they're proposing a reconceptualization of what our inner life involves. Uh, here's another objection. Um, this one uh, uh, comes up very often. Uh, and again, it's, I, I think it's often taken to be a knockdown objection against illusionism. Um, but I, I think it, 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 um, it, it, it just involves a, a misunderstanding of what illusionism is claiming. Um, so let me uh, set this out. Um, the suggestion is that illusionism isn't, isn't coherent for the following reason. Um, this is what the realist says. With phenomenal, when it comes to phenomenal consciousness, there, there can be no gap between appearance and reality. Um, if it seems to me that I am having a certain conscious experience, or having an experience of phenomenal uh, redness, say, then I am having uh, that experience. Uh, if I, if I, if it seems to me that I'm in pain, then I am in pain. Um, the, an illusion of pain, an illusion of phenomenal pain, would be would be phenomenal pain. Um, so, uh, phenomenal consciousness cannot be illusor illusory. Um, the appearance is the same as the reality. The appearance of being in pain, the, the, the introspective appearance of being in pain, um, the introspective uh, appearance of uh, uh, being acquainted with a with, with, with um, phenomenal redness or the, 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 the phenomenal. Um, quality of, of tasting coffee or whatever is the same thing as the reality there's no gap between appearance and reality when it comes to phenomenal consciousness here's um uh, so um, that of course means that illusionism is incoherent because the illusionist is saying well we, we just have the appearance of being in pain but the appearance of being in pain is the same thing as being in pain so uh, the, the, uh, Ill illusionism doesn't make sense it's, um, it's proposing to replace pain with the appearance of pain but the appearance of pain is pain so it's, it's circular uh, here's a, a little uh, quotation from the, the philosopher John Searle. Where consciousness is concerned, the existence of the appearance is the reality. If it seems to me exactly as if I'm having conscious experiences, then I am having conscious experiences. And uh, I think Searle sees that as a, as a knockdown argument against any, um, any position of this kind. Um, and I think many people think that's a pretty powerful argument. Um, so how does the illusionist respond? Well, well, the illusionist is going to say something like this. They're going to ask, what does it mean to seem to be having a reddish experience? It, um, illusionists want to talk, about, want to say that we seem to, to, to be acquainted with phenomenal properties. I just said it earlier. Um, but what does that mean? Now, the objector here is assuming that it means something like this. Having an experience with the same phenomenal feel as a reddish experience. Similarly, seeming to have a pain experience means having an experience with the same phenomenal feel as a pain experience. Okay, so they're, they're, they're interpreting seeming in phenomenal terms. To seem to have an experience of a certain thought is to have an experience with the same phenomenal feel as that one. So, in general, it assumes that when we talk about how things seem to us, we're talking about the mental qualities they produce in us. Okay, so uh, just start with perceptual seeming, not, not introspective seeming. No, just when it, um, we seem to see something to, that isn't really there, a phenomenal appearance of, of the thing is still being presented in the Cartesian theatre, as it were, we're still having a uh, corresponding uh, phenomenal image of the thing, as it were. So this is how the, the objector to illusionism is understanding seeming. They're understanding seemings as, as phenomenal appearances. 
Okay. So then, of course, if we if we understand seeming in that way, then if we want to talk as the illusionist does about seeming to have uh, phenomenal properties, then we're going to have to construe that in seeming in phenomenal terms too. And so we're going to have to say that to seem to introspect a phenomenal property that isn't really there, um, uh, and then that if we seem to introspect a phenomenal property that isn't really there, then a phenomenal appearance of that property is going to be presented in the Cartesian theatre. And the phenomenal appearance of a phenomenal property is, I guess, going to be the very same property. So, it looks incoherent or at least circular. So, the idea is that if we understand seeming in phenomenal terms, then illusionism is going to be incoherent because we're going to have to talk about having phenomenal appearances of phenomenal appearances and they're going to be the very same thing. So look, look I, we can illustrate that with a little a little diagram here. This would be the, the Cartesian theatre view of, of illusion or, or seeming. Um, to have an illusion of something, I talk of illusion here, but it's, it's uh, just the same thing as seeming. Uh, to have an illusion of something is for an appearance of the thing to be showing in the Cartesian theatre, so um, when the thing itself actually isn't there. So here, uh, the, 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 the egg isn't really there, but there's still uh, an appearance of it um, showing in the Cartesian theatre. Um, that's the, uh, uh, the Cartesian view of illusion or, or of seeming. This, this person is seeming to see an egg in virtue of there being a phenomenal appearance of an egg in his um, Cartesian theatre. So, to have the illusion of a show in a Cartesian theatre, which is what the illusionist is claiming we have, then there'd have to be an appearance of a Cartesian theatre showing in a second Cartesian theatre. So if that Cartesian theatre isn't there, but um, the, 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 the person seems to... Uh, be aware of a Cartesian theatre, then there's going to have to be a second Cartesian theatre in which a phenomenal appearance of that Cartesian theatre is shown. So, if we take this sort of view of illusion, of seeming, where we explain illusion, seeming, in terms of a, of a phenomenal appearance, then the idea that phenomenal appearances themselves might be illusions is going to be circular because it's going to just propose it's going to just involve having having another Cartesian theater and and uh, uh, if we try to do the same thing with that theater then we run into a, a, the danger of an endless regress okay so that's I think how the objection the no gap objection gets um, uh, gets to work um, but of course, the illusionist just doesn't take that view of what seeming is. Uh, illusionists don't have any truck with phenomenal appearances in Cartesian theatres at all when it comes to perception or introspection. They just don't think of seeming in that way. For illusionists, seemings, whether perceptual or introspective, don't involve mental qualities at all. Uh, for the illusionist to seem to perceive something, to seem to perceive the 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 the, 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 the egg, is just to be in an, an informational and reactive state similar to the one of actually perceiving it. So your um, your sense of existence are being stimulated in the way that they would be by the actual thing, and all the um, uh, the corresponding reactions and reactive dispositions are being triggered, and that's what's happening. No, no, no inner show, um, and. Similarly, to seem to introspect something uh, would involve the same thing happening at the second level of experience. So it would be to be in an informational reactive state similar to that of actually introspecting it. So your introspective systems are being stimulated and generating reactions that would be uh, uh, similar to those that would have been produced by actually uh, introspecting a phenomenal feel. The same effects are being produced as would have been produced by the real thing. The same uh, uh, information and reactive processes. 
So again, we, we can illustrate this with our diagram. So here, this is the, the illusionist view of, of illusion, of seeming. Um, so uh, ignore the, 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 the inner Cartesian theater at the moment, just concentrate on the, on the red and uh, green arrows and the, and, the, and the egg. So to have an illusion of something is to undergo perceptual and reactive processes similar to those we would undergo if the thing were real. So here the thing's real and we're undergoing these perceptual and reactive processes marked by the red and green arrows. And if the thing isn't real, uh, and we're just seeming to see it, we're under the illusion of seeing it, what's happening is that those um, perceptual and reactive processes are occurring just the same, even though the thing isn't there. That's all that's happening. Uh, so what about having the illusion of a show in a Cartesian theater? Well, that's to undergo, uh, that's uh, when the thing it itself isn't there, when there really isn't a Cartesian theater with a show in it. Uh, so to have an illusion of a show in a Cartesian theater is to undergo introspective and reactive processes similar to those we would undergo if there were a Cartesian theater. It's, so it's going to be getting patterns of information uh, that generate uh, reactions that would be appropriate if there were something like a show there. That, that would, it's uh, to have um, informational processes that make us judge that there's a, a show there and react in other ways as if there's a show there. Um, so, and there's no incoherence here. There's no regress. There's no... Um, uh, uh, there's no um, uh, basis for the objection. Okay, here's here's uh, another objection that um, is somewhat similar. I've called it the the higher order seeming objection. It goes like this. Uh, focus on the idea of uh, seeming to seem. Um, let me explain. The realist might say something like this. Look, the illusionist thinks that we should doubt our experience reports, our introspective experience reports. Um, we shouldn't take them as um, unrevisable data. We should be prepared to reinterpret them and correct them and um, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe dismiss some of them. But we can't do that. We can't doubt our, uh, 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 our um, own experience reports since experience reports already build in as much doubt as is possible. Uh, look at it like this. Um, I suppose I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at something and uh, I say, to, I say oh, there's, there's this big red patch there in front of me. And you say, well, are you sure? I mean, the lighting is very funny in here. Um, actually, maybe it's not red at all. And I say, well, I, maybe it isn't, but it, it certainly... There certainly seems to be a red patch there. It's certainly, it's, I'm, I'm having an experience as, as of a red patch. Uh, so I've retreated from the from the, the more the more the stronger claim that there is a red patch to the more cautious claim, more epistemically cautious claim that there seems to be a red patch. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to describe my, my epistemic situation, as it were, my situation with regard to my knowledge of what's around me. I start with a quite a bold claim about what's out there, and I retreat to a more cautious claim about, about my experience. Uh, but that's as, that's as far as I go. If you say to me, yes, but are you sure that it seems to you uh, that there's a red patch? Uh, I... <laughs> I have nowhere to go now. I can't, there's no considerations that I could draw on to make me doubt that it seems to me. I, 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 I just, I just kind of <laughs> attend to, to my experience and I'm inclined to say, yes, it seems that there's a red patch and that's it. I, uh, there's nothing you can say to me really or that I, I can say to myself that might lead me to, to qualify that claim or I don't really have the, the vocabulary to um, to qualify it, how would I, how would I, 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 to say that it seem? Should I say that it seems to seem to me that there's a red patch? That's not the sort of thing we say, and it's not clear what it what it what it means. Really. The illusionist suggestion here that we should that we could doubt our, our our experience reports doesn't seem to make much much sense. It doesn't seem to um, fit into any way we have of criticizing or qualifying 
our own experience reports. Uh, the claim that uh, there seems to be a red patch there, it seems to me that there's a red patch there, that's, that's as far as I can go. That expresses all the epistemic caution uh, that's possible or, or, or necessary, it seems. That's just where I stop. Um, so uh, the illusionist wants us to go further, and there doesn't seem to be anywhere to go. So how does the illusionist respond to that? Well, I, the illusionist can concede some of this. It, it's perfectly true that we've no procedure for correcting experience reports when they're made attentively. We might say to the person, well, just, you know, just are, are you sure that it seems that way? Just pay attention to your experience a bit more. Um, and we might, um, of course, we might want to check that the person's being sincere and not trying to um, uh, deceive us. But if we're satisfied that they've made this report carefully and attentively and that they're not trying to deceive us, then we just we just accept it. We treat it as authoritative. We've, we've no procedure for correcting other people's reports or correcting our or qualifying our own experience reports. We, we, we just accept them. Um, they such reports are the, are the best we can do. If, if you ask me to describe my um, uh, my perceptual situation, uh, that's 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 the best I can do, and I've just got to stop. But it still doesn't follow from that that these reports are guaranteed to be accurate. The fact that we can't do any more doesn't show that we've achieved perfect accuracy. Here's how I like to put it: that being cautious about the external world, being cautious about uh, expressing caution about what's out there in the external world, whether there really is a red patch out there, doesn't make automatically make what you authoritative about an internal world. Uh, seeming to see a, a red patch out there isn't the same uh, as infallibly introspecting some mental reddishness. Or at least it may not be the same. It, it's possible that it's not the same, as the illusionist wants to say. So the our first, per so our first person introspective reports, they, they take us to the limits of what we can say about our situation. But it doesn't follow that they take us to a completely accurate description of some internal reality. Uh, there's nothing more we can say, but it may be that there is a lot more that could be said by neuroscience. Say. Uh, these are just our limits as uh, unaided introspectors. So is it wrong then to treat uh, experience reports as authoritative? Well, it, it depends on how uh, what, uh, what we mean by that, what we take that authority to involve. If we take it to mean that they are completely accurate descriptions of a private internal uh, of, a, of a private mental world that's known only to the introspector, then the illusionist is going to say, no, well, we, we, we shouldn't treat them as authoritative in that sense. Um, uh, there, with, with, with that report, the, um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the person themselves has reached the limit of what they can say uh, and has no way of, of correcting it, but it doesn't follow that it's accurate and that we may have... Uh, um, uh, many ways of, 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 of doing better uh, by interpreting what they've said in the light of, of uh, neuroscientific theory. Uh, a theory of the, the, the processes that are actually occurring within their brains and that they are uh, and that, that they are, and that they uh, that the processes that are actually occurring in their brains, in which they are uh, indirectly, uh, in which they are indirectly uh, describing to us through this vocabulary, through this uh, phenomenal vocabulary. But if we think of phenomenal reports, experience reports, as characterizing something more like a fictional world, uh, a, a theoretical fiction created through. Uh, uh, the, the reporter's introspective activity, uh, then we, we can treat them as authoritative. They are telling us how it seems to be with them, and they are creating a picture of this of this 
entire world they seem to be confronted with. And it's the fact that, they, that they're inclined to describe it in that way is very interesting. And uh, they can have complete authority to fill in all the details in whatever way seems natural to them. And the fact that it seems natural to describe the world in that way and to characterize the fiction and uh, uh, to characterize this world in that way is very important uh, and useful information about what is really happening because there are real processes, real introspective processes that are prompting this description. The mistake would be to treat the description as being wholly accurate. We need to interpret it. We need to adopt the heterophenomenological attitude to it and try to see uh, the, uh, the real picture that underlies that uh, that uh, that fiction. The fiction uh, uh, does have some basis in reality. It's not created on the basis of nothing. There are real introspective processes that are prompting this this description, but the description is cast in a fictional uh, form, um, which is the best we can do, uh, given the limits of introspection. So since the, de the subject is describing how it seems to them, how, uh, how they're disposed to characterize their internal world, then, of course, we, we allow them authority over that. Um, no one can say better how they're inclined to describe their own internal world than, than them. So we let them give the characterization. We just don't treat it as uh, necessarily accurate. The description they give needs to be interpreted in the light of wider theory, theory from, uh, or, or in, in the light of information from all branches of the cognitive sciences. Okay, so, uh, so we can allow that uh, uh, that experience reports are, are authoritative, uh, but only uh, authoritative um, um, descriptions of of an inner world, but only if we think of those inner worlds as notional constructions from from the judgments as a kind of as a kind of theoretical fiction constructed uh, in the course of making these judgments uh, these um, uh, uh, phenomenal reports and uh, uh, judgments so that's the response then to the to the uh, higher order seeming objection the um, the objection that it's incoherent to talk of seeming to seem uh, it's um, it's the objector's right that we've no procedure for correcting or qualifying these reports. We, there we've reached the limits of what we can say about our epistemic situation. Um, but it's a mistake to infer from that that there's nothing more to be said um, uh, and that these reports have to be treated as accurate descriptions of a, of a, of a, of a private mental reality. Okay. Okay, now, so... <clears throat> Okay, now, so let's move on to another objection. I've, I've called this one the, the audience objection. It's, it's, it's another one that comes up quite often. Um, it, it goes like this. The realist um, points out that an illusion uh, presupposes an audience who, who witness it um, and, uh, and are fooled by it. So who's the audience for the illusion of phenomenal consciousness? Uh, who or what introspects experiences and undergoes the illusion that they have phenomenal properties. Isn't, isn't the illusionist in danger of reintroducing something like a, like a, like a Cartesian theatre here? Now, you can probably guess how the illusionist will respond to this on the basis of uh, things, we've, um, uh, um, things I've already said. Um, the illusionist is going to say that the objection here... Uh, assumes a Cartesian view of what an illusion is. It assumes that uh, when you're the victim of an illusion, uh, the whatever it is that you seem to be seeing isn't really there, but that there's uh, a, a mental appearance of it uh, displayed in the Cartesian theatre. You're, you're, you're acquainted with, a, with a, a phenomenal image of it, as it were. And, of course, that the illusionist uh, rejects that view of uh, illusion. They say that perceptual illusions don't require an inner audience, an, an inner show and an inner audience to watch the show. Uh, if, um, if, um, uh, if you're under the, uh, uh, if you're hallucinating something, if you're hallucinating a, uh, a, um, a pink rabbit in front of you, 
that doesn't re- that doesn't involve uh, a, a phenomenal appearance of a pink rabbit uh, uh, in your mind and a, and a, some inner ob- uh, observer witnessing that. It, that that whole picture is 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 is, is rejected by the illusionist. Uh, they also say that a perceptual illusion just involves a lot of subpersonal representational and reactive processes, the uh, experiences in the psychological sense. So uh, uh, your sensory systems, systems are being stimulated, being activated in the way that they would be by a, a real pink rabbit, and they're producing all the, the appropriate reactions and so on to a real pink rabbit. And that all these subpersonal processes collectively support the personal level belief, the belief that you have, that there's a pink rabbit there. And that's the illusion. There's no inner audience w- watching this. There's just there's just a lot of subpersonal representational reactive processes and you having the perceptual belief that there's a there's a pink rabbit there. And the illusionist will say that introspective illusions are similar. If I have the, uh, if I if I'm under the illusion of of being me- uh, uh, acquainted with a directly acquainted with a, uh, a m- mental quality of reddishness, a, a red quality, um, it doesn't mean that a that doesn't involve a, a a phenomenal appearance of that phenomenal quality being presented in a second Cartesian theatre uh, where it's witnessed by. Uh, uh, some audience. It doesn't involve anything like that. It involves these uh, higher order experiences. We talked about these introspective experiences where, um, that, uh, which involve a sensitivity to one's own uh, first order experiences, which involve uh, constructing representations and models of uh, one's first order experiences and uh, generating reactions um, uh, to those uh, first order experiences. And all of this, of course, is is at a subpersonal level. It's uh, these these are these representations and the reactions and the control processes. These are these are all uh, things that are that are uh, properly attributed to brain systems. It's the brain systems that construct and use these representations, not you yourself. But all this subpersonal activity supports uh, personal level attitudes. Uh, supports the. Uh, sensitivities and dispositions that constitute personal level uh, attitudes, in this case the personal level uh, introspective beliefs, the belief that you're acquainted with uh, a quality of, of, of red. So on this view there, there need be no audience for the illusion smaller than the, than the person as a whole. Um, uh, inside my my brain, there are all, all kinds of informational and reactive processes that collectively constitute the state that we describe as my having the introspective belief that I've got this inner world of this rich inner world of of mental qualities. Uh, so, the audience is just insofar as there is an audience, it's just me. I'm the person who's who's fooled because I have all these uh, beliefs about my. Um, about my my own mind, all these introspective beliefs uh, that are not accurate. Okay, uh, I, I mentioned before we close. I'll mention a couple more objections. Um, we'll be returning to both of these later, so I, I won't say too much here. Uh, here's one uh, which I called, which I've called the ethical objection. Um, this goes like this: the realist says. Our ethical attitudes assume the existence of phenomenal consciousness. The thought is that the reason we care about other people, about their welfare, is because they have phenomenally conscious states, because we, it's, we, we believe it's like something to be them. Um, and we thought it wasn't something like, uh, like something to be them. They didn't have this uh, inner world of phenomenal qualities. Then we wouldn't care about them. If we thought they were just pieces of machinery, uh, like a complex robot... Uh, we wouldn't care about them. We don't think that it's, we think it's, and uh, similarly for other creatures, I mean, we think it's it's wrong to kick a dog. We don't think it's wrong to kick a robot dog. And the reason, according to the realist, is because we think that the the, the, the dog has a, has, is phenomenally conscious. It feels like something when you kick it. It doesn't feel like, so, it, it feel like something uh, for the robot. 
uh, when you kick it. And that's that's why it's it's okay to do one and not to do the other. But if illu- so, if illusionism is true and people don't have uh, 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 this private world of phenomenal consciousness, then we've no reason to care for their welfare, um, for other people's welfare, or indeed for our own, I suppose. Uh, now, as I said, we'll return to this and discuss this at more length in in um, in, in lecture six. But I'll, I'll just indicate briefly. I think the the uh, the approach the illusionist uh, should take here. Um, first, I don't think it's true that our ethical attitudes depend on a particular conception of consciousness. Uh, we can all agree uh, on... It, it, it's the point I mentioned earlier about the fact that we can all agree how to apply experience concepts. We can all agree when uh, someone's uh, in pain. Um, we know we, we can reliably identify pain experiences in ourselves and, and in our, our other creatures. And we all agree that these experiences, that these states, whatever they are, matter. That that, that person we can say is, 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 is currently uh, uh, having a pain experience. And that matters. And we should try to reduce the number of people, the, the number of occasions on which people have pain experiences. And we can all agree on that without taking view on what pain experiences actually involve, whether they involve acquaintance with mental qualia or whether they involve uh, the complex um, uh, functional states, uh, experiences in the, that, that I described earlier, the uh, experiences in the psychological sense. So I, I don't see that there's that as any immediate threat to our ethical attitudes, uh, provided we can all agree on when people are having uh, different kinds of experiences and which of these experiences are good and which are bad and so on. If we agree on that, we can we can just proceed uh, as uh, as before. But even if that weren't true, even if people uh, did think that, um, if people do think that, uh, uh, do regard their ethical attitudes as as requ- as, as um, based on uh, a certain theory of what experience is, the theory that it involves uh, acquaintance with um, with phenomenal properties, uh, I and uh, I don't think that the accepting illusionism would force us to give up our attitudes, our ethical attitudes. Rather, we could revise our beliefs about what grounds those attitudes. We could give up the belief that those attitudes are justified only if uh, uh, the um, uh, phenomenal realism is true. Um, uh, we could give them a, a bet. We could give our moral attitudes, a, our ethical attitudes, a better basis, a sounder basis. I mean, if illusionism is true, then that way of grounding our ethic, our attitudes, is, is misguided because they, uh, we're assuming that we should care. For, we, we, it follows that we should care for people only if a false theory is true. Okay, so we don't want to. We don't want to. Um, to um, uh, uh, and and uh, so if we dis, I mean. If it turns out that our ethical attitudes depend on a certain theory that is false, I mean, one option is we could say, okay, we'll we'll, we'll give up the attitudes. Another is to say, well, let's give our ethical attitudes a sounder basis. We don't have to uh, assume this particular theoretical basis for these attitudes, since that one's been shown to be false. Let's give them a better basis. And uh, this has happened um, over and over. I mean, uh, people... And many people, um, I guess, would say that our ethical attitudes assu- uh, depend on uh, belief that there is a God. But uh, uh, and so a- atheism threatens to undermine all our ethical attitudes. But we don't have to uh, uh, to let that happen. We can say no. Let's ground our, atti- our ethical attitudes in a different way, in a way that doesn't assume uh, that doesn't require the existence of of, of a supernatural. Um, uh, uh, being, uh, or take free will. Uh, some people think that our uh, practices of holding people responsible for their actions, of uh, praising and blaming what they do, uh, 
depend on our possessing, on humans possessing, a particularly strong form of free will, so that their actions are not are not uh, completely determined by physical processes, uh, and they and uh, people have the power to to intervene in the to make decisions that that somehow change the course of the physical processes in the world. Um, now, um, there are good reasons to think that we don't have that form of free will, uh, and you could infer from that, you could conclude from that that we should give up praising and blaming people. Uh, but you don't have to. You could equally uh, uh, rethink the basis for our attitudes of praise and blame and find a, a better, sounder basis for these attitudes. The, the question here is, do we think these attitudes are good ones, are useful ones? Uh, should we continue uh, uh, to maintain our practices of holding people responsible for what they do? And if we do, and we discover that the base, the, the theoretical basis we had for those attitudes is actually unsound, then the sensible thing to do is to find another better basis for them. And similarly, uh, for um, our uh, concern for other people's welfare. Uh, if it were the case that uh, this concern were grounded in a particular conception of consciousness, and that conception of consciousness turned out to be false, it wouldn't follow that we should cease to care about other people's welfare. Um, we might choose instead to find a better basis for our ethical concern. And I think that uh, can, uh, can be done quite, quite satisfactorily, um, perhaps even better uh, on an illusionist, uh, uh, within a, from an illusionist um, perspective. Uh, so, as I said, we'll come back to this, uh, this question at more length in, chapter, in uh, Lecture 6. One final objection, uh, the representation objection. Uh, okay, so the, the objection goes like this. Uh, illusionists deny that phenomenal properties uh, are real, uh, but they claim that we represent ourselves as having uh, phenomenal properties. Um, we think about phenomenal properties. We have the concept of a phenomenal property. Um, so how do we manage to do this? Um, phenomenal properties don't exist. How do we manage to represent them? Uh, how do we even acquire these concepts? Um, we acquire concepts of things around us in the world because we're in touch with those things and uh, people point them out to us and uh, say the, the, the word for them and we, um, we, gra we gradually acquire the concept. Uh, how do we acquire phenomenal concepts? How do we acquire concepts of things that just don't exist? Um, and how do these phenomenal concepts uh, get their content? Um, oh, how do they come to, to be about uh, the things they're about? Um, we think of a concept as some sort of uh, uh, state of the brain, uh, like a mental symbol, as we, we talked about in the first lecture, that represents something in the world. How does it get to represent that thing in the world? One way in which, uh, one theory of how uh, mental symbols get to represent things in the world is that they do so because they're, uh, they're causally sensitive to the presence of those things. So uh, there's a little pattern of brain firing say represents dogs it's because that uh, pattern of that that pattern of neurons fires when uh, uh when we come into contact with the dog when we see a dog or hear a dog bark or whatever and when we have some interaction with a dog it causes this little uh, the, 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 this little group of neurons to fire and that's how that uh, group of neurons comes to represent dogs well how do phenomenal concepts get their evident? It can't be by being causally sensitive to the presence of phenomenal properties, since phenomenal properties don't uh, uh, don't exist on the um, uh, according to the illusionist. So, <clears throat> how do we manage to think about these things to represent these things to ourselves if if they don't if they don't exist? Uh, and also, how can these symbols, these representations of phenomenal concepts, how can they capture the richness of phenomenality? I mean, they might allow us to, to think about phenomenal properties, but how do they manage to capture the, the, um, the seeming uh, 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 reality of the things, the, the, uh, the, um, the vividness, the presence of, the, of these, uh, uh, the apparent presence of the, these qualitative properties? It's not just that we're thinking of something um, 
uh, where, where we think of something imaginary like a um, as a unicorn or something, I have this vague image of a unicorn or whatever it might be. Or, uh, we're thinking of something here that seems very vivid and real and present to us. And how can, how can, how can a, a mere conceptual representation of that thing uh, do that? Uh, do that work? Play that role? Um, now, uh, so what can the illusionists say? Uh, so. One thing the illusionists can say here is that, to some extent, this is a problem for everyone. Um, uh, many realists would agree that it's possible to uh, represent oneself as having phenomenal consciousness without actually having it. Um, after all, remember that uh, many realists concede that, that zombies are conceivable. And zombies, are, of course, are creatures that are psychological duplicates of us. They have all the same um, uh, mental, state, uh, mental states that we do uh, in the functional sense, in the psychological sense. They have introspective states just like ours. Uh, they believe that they are phenomenally conscious in just the way that, that, that we do, even though they, like, uh, they, they, they actually uh, lack... Um, phenomenal consciousness. So clearly zombies are going to uh, uh, represent themselves as having phenomenal properties. They're going to have some form of phenomenal concepts. Oh. So uh, if zombies are conceivable, then it certainly must be conceivable that, um, that, they, that, um, uh, that uh, a creature could have phenomenal concepts without having phenomenality. And indeed, it's if we remember from the discussion of the meta problem in uh, uh, in the last lecture, it's many realists are willing to accept that the explanation of our phenomenal uh, reports, our phenomenal judgments and reports, may not actually need to mention uh, phenomenal consciousness itself. So, um, uh, so it, again, this uh, this explanation will be given in terms of. Uh, experiences and introspective processes in the psychological sense, in the functional sense, in the sense that involves informational and reactive processes. So again, it's probably going to have to refer to uh, phenomenal concepts, which are doing the work of representing phenomenality uh, without actually being sensitive to its presence, because we can tell the whole story about them without actually mentioning phenomenal consciousness at all. So it looks as if realists are also going to have to admit that uh, it's possible to have uh, phenomenal concepts, uh, representations of phenomenality, without phenomenality itself. Um, uh, at least, uh, in some sense, maybe they would say that these are not full-blown phenomenal concepts, but something like phenomenal concepts, uh, uh, concepts that do uh, that at least produce the kind of, uh, uh, have the kind of effects that uh, full-blown phenomenal concepts would have. And uh, another thing that the illusionists will say is that there's a general problem in, in uh, representing non-existent things. We, we, we can certainly do this. We can certainly think about things that, that don't exist. We can think about Father Christmas and, and, and unicorns and, um, uh, and so on. And indeed, we can think about things that, that couldn't possibly exist, like um, the, uh, uh, the impossible triangle the Penrose Triangle that we, that we discussed. Um, so certainly our minds have a capacity for representing things that don't exist, and it's not clear why uh, there should be more of a problem in, uh, in representing uh, non-existent phenomenal properties. The phenomenal, uh, the um, illusionist is going to have to admit, I think, that the content of phenomenal concepts can't be fixed simply by causal connections to the, to the, to the things they're about, um, in the way that uh, uh, the concept of dogs might be, uh, the, the, the mental symbol for dog might be, uh, uh, might get its content through, uh, through being causally sensitive to the presence of dogs, the, the, one, the mental symbol for um, the, the quality of redness can't be, uh, uh, can't get its content uh, through being causally sensitive to the presence of that quality, since the quality is never present. Um, 
But that doesn't mean that uh, that we can't uh, uh, give some account of, of how uh, these concepts do get their um, content. But there are other accounts of of um, uh, mental content uh, around, and uh, uh, there are plenty of options here, I think, for the illusionist. The illusionist can say um, perhaps that... Uh, the content of uh, phenomenal concepts is fixed by their by their functional role by by the uh, by the effects they have in uh, uh, in inference inference for example so um, so the the general idea here is that the content of a concept can be fixed by its relations to other concepts so uh, so the concept of dog say is related to the, the has relations specific relations to to other concepts such as the concept of uh, of uh, animal, uh, a living thing, animal, uh, pet, uh, barks, uh, has four legs, uh, wags its tail, and so on. man's best friend, and it's these, these, the relation, its, pos its position it occupies in a network of other concepts that make it the concept that to get, make it the concept it is the concept of of dog, uh, and similarly, uh, the illusionist might say something about similar about phenomenal concepts they they get their to have their con, uh, content by their relation to other phenomenal concepts and the relation uh, to other non-phenomenal concepts and um, spelling this out is going to be um, quite uh, quite tricky probably but there's no reason in principle to think it can't be done so really what we have here is, is not so much a, an objection to illusionism as as a, a, a description of part of of the illusionist program it's this is certainly something illusionists need to to um, to think about and to produce um, uh, an account of, and um, so it's really a, a part of the illusionist agenda rather than uh, rather than an objection to the to the um, uh, to, to to the program itself. And we will have more discussion of that uh, in the next lecture, where where we look at um, the different ways in which the uh, illusionist. Um, uh, approach to consciousness might be developed. Okay, so that's the end of this lecture. I'm, uh, that's our brief run through of some uh, objections to illusionism. You may well have more ob uh, objections of your own, and uh, uh, I hope we'll have a chance to, to discuss those um, together at some point. Uh, in the meantime, uh, the next lecture will be on uh, as I mentioned, on varieties of illusionism, illusionism itself is a is a is a uh, is a very broad framework for thinking about consciousness, and within that framework, many different uh, specific theories could be developed. And so, next time we'll we'll look at um, the different paths an illusionist can take, the different um, options that there are for the illusionist, and uh, get an, a sense of uh, the the landscape of theories the landscape of illusionist theories. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, thank you for listening, and I will see you next time.